Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome to today's show. Um, I thought I'd do a, you know, some different, but yet some I've done before, uh, which is basically go on to um, uh, MMTR's uh, website, you know, the websites, their blogs, whatever, and basically just read out what they have on on their websites, um, just so I can uh, hopefully try to be able to promote their stuff as well. Um, even though I have a very limited audience as far as viewers. I do have uh, 400 something subscribers, so maybe I'll get lucky and, you know, maybe they'll actually look at it, you know, that's one thing. Anyway, so this is actually from someone that I'm relatively new to, uh, Richard Murphy, who apparently, uh, as you can see up here, is, uh, uh, on his account, uh, is in the accounting and political economy. Uh, and he did do, um, like some like uh some stuff on uh twitter that i that i took notice of anyway so this is from today um uh he, he states uh, i spent a lot of time criticizing the management of hm revenue and customs and for good reason in my opinion so i should give praise where when it is due yesterday the guardian noted that Former Formula One boss Bernie uh, Ecclestone and will face charges of fraud by by false represent of uh, uh, fraud by false representation after an investigation by the UK tax authorities that allegedly found under uh, undeclared assets worth more than uh, 400 million euro overseas. The UK's Crown Pro uh, Prosecution Service, or CPS, said on Monday it had a it had authorized the charging uh, Bernard Charles Ecclestone with a fraud by false representation, or false representation, excuse me, following a HM Revenue and Customs, and I think that's probably the IRS there, uh, investigation. The and that's in quotes. The investigation was dubbed an Operation Ga Gaelic by the authorities. Uh, I welcome this, uh, not because it is uh, Ecclestone. I welcome the fact that M uh, HMRC is going to prosecute a big case involving a well-known person because this is essentially, or that this is essential. If the right warning signs to encourage compliance are, are be sent to others. I have no idea whether Ecclestone is guilty or not. I suspect that HMRC are very confident given they bring so few such cases. But again, this is not the point. The, what matters are three things. First, this says the, ta the tax compliance matters. Second, it says that the data from offshore is now good enough to be used and I worked long and hard to help make that happen. Third, it says they're going to tax the wealthy, and that also that is also important in terms of encouraging compliance from everyone else. But now I hope they win. I hope I uh, haven't gone this far. Okay, so I don't know if that part. <laughs> I thought it was a little bit uh, longer, but anyway, so let's see. Let's go to Stephanie Kelton's. Uh, she has uh, one on her uh, Substack, as you can see, is stephanikelton.substack.com. Uh, Social Security Independence Day. This was I was on the fourth a while back, uh, but I haven't actually seen that new um, uh, Substack from her yet. Happy Fourth of July to everyone with two hundred ninety-one thousand in gross annual wage income. Today is the last day you will contribute to Social Security. For you, Independence Day Independence Day begins tomorrow. When you take home pay, will jump by 6.2%. That's because only about half of your wage, include 50.5%, uh, 50 uh, 50 is subject to the payroll tax withholding for Social Security. It's not well known that people pay into Social Security only on the first 147,000 they make, while most fall far below this level in pay per round. Those with those with high salaries only contribute for part of the year. Input a salary and find the last day when the subject to Social Security taxes, two hundred ninety one thousand gross annual wage income in twenty twenty two. Last day when the tax is levied, Monday, July fourth. 
uh, wage income subjected to tax, 50.5%. Total amount of the tax levied, 9,114. Uh, effective tax rate, 3.1%. If the tax cap of 147000 were scrapped and everyone paid the same rate, not tax rate, the amount of extra, extra taxes levied would be 8928 which would be 3.1%. I guess this is according to CEPR.net. Uh, source authors of calculation and Social Security Administration. Uh, SEPR, there you go. Anyway, so for those of you with gross annual wage income of 147000 or less, your contribution will continue through December 31st. That's because 100% of your income is subject to the payroll tax withholding. It's not, uh, it's not well known that people pay into Social Security only on the first 147000 they make. While most fall far below the level and pay per round, those with high salaries are contributing far for part of the year. Okay, as I okay, so input a salary and yeah, okay, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, da -da. Last day when the tax is levied, Saturday, December 31st, 2022. Wage income subject to the tax 100%. Total amount of the tax levied. 6.2% or 9,114. If the tax cap of 147 were scrapped, as you can see, anyway, uh, many Democrats, I was trying to do like the whole thing, but obviously it was the same thing, um, except for two different numbers. Uh, many Democrats would like to change that. Here's Senator Bernie Sanders, who she used to work, with, she used to work for. Today, uh, absurdly and unfairly, there is a cap on income subject to Social Security taxes, which is just 147000 a year. That means that if you're a multi-billionaire, uh, you pay the same amount uh, into Social Security as someone making 147000 a year. It means if you make 147000 a year or less, you pay 6.2% of your income in Social Security taxes, but you make 10 times more. One, let's see, uh, one million four hundred seventy. 470, I think that's, I think that's what it is. Uh, you pay just 62 cents of, air, of your income in social security taxes. Or is that 62 percent? I'm with it too. Um, and so in your, in your income in social security taxes, that may make sense to someone. It doesn't make sense to me. Sanders has introduced legislation to challenge, or sorry, to change the way the payroll tax withholding is applied. It won't pass, but if it did, it would apply the Social Security payroll uh, tax to all forms of income, including capital gains and dividends. For those who make over 250000 a year, it would have no impact on 93% or 93.6% of the American of Americans, but it would raise taxes on the wealthiest 6.4% uh, of the households. As I've explained in recent columns, this uh, his motivation is simple. Our legislation would make uh, Social Security solvent for the next, say, five years, expand benefits for uh, seniors and people with disability for 2,400 a year, an increase in COLA, which would lift millions of seniors out of poverty. I won't rehash the MMT line of argument here. Just click on what the, okay, anyway. So that is cool. And I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. I hope you liked the Granny Gamer um, advertisement. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Now we are at uh, the Bill Mitchell Mind Monetary Theory blog on bilbo.economicoutlook.net. Uh, uh, I'll be putting all the, um, obviously I'll be putting on the uh, links that I have run from in the description below. So anyway, uh, last Friday, July 8th, 2022, the U.S. Bureau of Local Statistics, uh, or BLS, released their latest labor market data uh, employment situation summary of June 2022, as you can see the link, uh, which reported a total payroll employment raise a rise of only 
372,000 jobs and an official unemployment rate of 3.6%. While it might seem that the June and the May results are steady as she goes, the reality is that the June figures reveal the first signs of a slowdown in the U.S. labor market. The labor survey employment measure fell as did the, the participation rate. There was a fall in the, uh, in the employment population ratio, a fairly reliable measure that the demand side is lagging behind the supply side. The U.S. labor market is still 524,000 payroll jobs short from where it was at the end of 2020, which helps to explain why there are no wage pressures emerging. Real wages continue to decline as the supply disruptions and the greed of increased corporate profit margin push to stay in the inflationary pressures. Any anal analyst who is claiming the U.S. economy is close to full employment uh, hasn't looked at the data. The justification by the Fed, U.S. Federal Reserve for pushing up interest rates to quarrel wages wages pressure does not stack up with the evidence. Overview of June 2022, payroll employment increased by 372,000. Total labor force survey employment fell by 350,000 net or 0.2%. The seasonally adjusted labor uh, force fell by 353,000 net or 0.21%. The employment population ratio fell uh, by 0.2% to 59.9%, still lower than the May 2020 peak of 61.2%. Uh, official employment fell by 38,000 to 5,912,000. Uh, the official unemployment rate was unchanged at 3.6%. The participation rate fell by 0 0.1 points to 62.2%. The broad labor uh, underutilization measure or U6, uh, U6 I think, uh, fell by 0.4% to 6.7% as underemployment increased. Those who are confused about the difference between payroll uh, establishment data and the household survey data, you should read this blog post. U.S. labor market is in a deplorable state, in a deplorable state, where I explain the differences in detail. Some months the difference is difference is small, while other months the, the difference is large. The differences were quite large this month. Payroll employment trends. The bill has noted that uh, total non-farm payroll employment rose by 372,000 in June, in line with the average monthly gain of over three months, or or plus 383. In June, notable job growth occurred in professional and business services, leisure and hospitality, and healthcare. Non, oh, sorry, total non-farm employment is down by 524,000 or 0.3% from its pre-pandemic level. In February of 2020, private sector employment has recovered the net job loss due to the pandemic and is 140,000 higher than February 2020, while government employment is 664,000 lower. Employment in professional and business service should continue to grow with an increase of 74,000 in June is 880,000 higher than in February of 2020. In June, leisure and, and uh, hospitality added 67,000 jobs is down by 1.3 million or 7.8% since February of 2020. Employment in healthcare rose by 57,000 in June, is below its February 2020 level by 176,000 or 1.1%. 
In June, tra transportation and warehousing uh, added 36,000 jobs as 759,000 above its five, February 2020 level. Employment is ma in manufacturing increased by 29,000 in June and has returned to its February 2020 level. Information added 25,000 jobs in June is 105,000 higher than in February of 2020. I don't get this communication and stuff of that nature. In June, employment and social assistance rose by 21,000 and is down by 87,000 or 2.0% since February 2020. Wholesale trade added 16,000 jobs in June it is down by 18,000 or 0.3% since February of 2020. Mining employment rose by 5,000 in June is six uh, is 86,000 above a recent low in February 2021. Employment show little change over the month in other major industries, including construction, retail trade, uh, retail trade as it says, financial activities, other services, and government. This uh, first graph shows the monthly change in payroll employment in thousands uh, expressed as a three-month moving average to take out the monthly noise. The red lines are the annual averages. I left out the observations between January 2020 and observations, excuse me, and September 2020. Uh, while we're so, which were so extreme that they made it harder to compare the current period with the pre-pandemic history. The U.S. labor market is still 524,000 jobs short from where it was at in the end of May of 2020 and com commentary from the BLS above tells us how the shortfall is distributed around the sectors. The next graph shows the same data in a different way. In this case, the graph shows the average net monthly change in payroll employment or actual for the, uh, for the calendar years from 20, 2005 to 2021. The red marker on the column is the current month's result. The final average for 2021, uh, 2020, excuse me, 2019 was 164,000. The final average for 2020 was minus 774,000. The, uh, the final average for 2021 was 562,000. The average so far for 2020 is 457,000. Labor, uh, labor force survey, employment growth declines. Uh, the data for June 2022 reveals one total labor force survey employment fell by 315,000 net 0.2%. Two, the seasonal adjusted above uh, adjusted labor force fell by 353,000 net, which is which is 0.21%. The participation rate fell by 0.1% to 62.2%. Uh, excuse me. Number four, as a result, in accounting terms, or in accounting terms, total measured unemployment fell by 38,000 to 5,912, and the official unemployment rate was unchanged at 3.6%, rounded to one decimal place. The following graph shows the monthly employment growth since January 2008 and excludes the extreme observations uh, outliers between 2020 and October of 2020, which dis distorts the current period relative to the pre-pandemic period. The employment population ratio is a good measure of the strength of the labor market because the movement are relatively un un ambiguous because the denominator population is not particularly sensitive to the cycle, unlike the labor force. The following graph shows the imp U.S. employment population from January, 20, uh, January 1950 to June 2022. While the ratio fluctuates a little, the May 2020 fell by 
8.6 percent, uh, 8.6 8 points to 51.3 percent, which is the largest monthly fall since the sample began in January of 1948. In June of 2022, the ratio fell by 0.2 percent, or points, excuse me, to 59.9 percent significantly a weaken, a weakening of the labor market. Unemployment and underutilization trends. The BLS notes or note that the unemployment rate was 3.6 percent for the fourth month in a row and the number of unemployed persons was essentially unchanged at 5.9 million in June. These measures are little are yeah are a little different from the from their value uh, February 2020, which was 3.5 percent and 5.7 million, respectively, prior to the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. In June, the number of long-term unemployed, these those jo jobless for 27 weeks or more, was essentially unchanged at 1.3 million. The measure is 215,000 higher than in February of 2020. The long-term unemployed accountant uh, accounted for 22.6% of all unemployed persons in June. The number of persons employed part-time for economic reasons declined by 707,000 uh, to 3.6 million in June and is below its February 2020 level of 4.4 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. These individuals who were ha uh, who would have preferred full-time employment were working part-time because their hours had been reduced or they were unable to find full-time jobs. The official unemployment rate is narrow measure of a labor wastage, which means that a strict comparison with the 1960s, for example, in terms of how tight the labor market has to take into account broader measure uh, measures of labor underutilization. The next graph shows the BLS measure U6, which is defined as total unemployed plus all marginally attached workers plus total employed part-time for economic reasons as a percent, percent, uh, percent of all civilian labor uh, force, pl uh, labor force plus all marginally attached workers. It is thus the broadest a uh, quantitative measure of labor util underutilization that the BLS published. Pre-COVID, U6 was at 6.8% uh, in December 2019. In June 2022, the U6 uh, measure was 6.7%, a fall of 0 0.4 points on the previous month. The fall was largely due to significant fall in workers forced to work part-time for economic reasons, which is the U.S. indicator of under underemployed. Ethnicity and education. The next uh, graph shows the ev evolution of unemployment rates for three cohorts based on educational attachment or attainment, excuse me. A, those with less than high school completion. B, high school graduates, and C, university graduates. The unemployment rate for, per, uh, for a person with university degree is 2.1%, while the other groups are much higher. And the collapse in, sorry, uh, yeah, in, in the collapse in unemployment uh, in the early months of the pandemic, the, un, uh, the unemployment rose, rate rose by 14.2 percent uh, points, excuse me, for those with less than high school diploma. 13.2 percent are keep doing that. 13.2 uh, points for high school, no college graduates, and 5.9 points for those with university degrees. Uh, the period since May 2020 has seen the under uh, the unemployment rate fall by 13.3. Uh, Excuse me, Jesus. 15.3 points for those with less than high school diploma, meaning the unemployment rate is now 1.1 points below the March 2020 level. 14 points for high school, no college graduates, meaning the unemployment rate is now 0.8 points above the March 2020 level. 
6.3% uh, for those who uh, with university degrees, meaning the unemployment rate is now 0.4% uh, points below the March 2020 level. In the last month, the change uh, in the unemployment rate has been a raise, uh, not raise, but a rise of 0.6 points for those with less than high school diploma, a fall of uh, 0 0.2 points for high school, no college degrees, uh, or sorry, college graduates, uh, a rise of 0 0.1 points for those with university degrees. So the least educated are now going backwards. The first signs of a more general decline in the labor market. In the U.S. context, the trends in uh, yeah, trends and trends and un unemployment by ethnicity are interesting. Two questions arise: One, how uh, how have the Black and African American and white uh, unemployment rates fared? In the post uh, GFC period, or I think that's a uh, oh anyway, um, great financial crisis. There we go. Uh, how has the relationship between the Black and African American unemployment rate and the White unemployment rate changed since the GFC? The summary: One, all the series move tight together as their economic activity cycles. The data has also moves around a lot in a monthly basis. The Black and African American unemployment rate was 6.8% in May 2020, rose to 16.6% uh, in May 2020, and, and is at 5.8% in June of 2020. In the last month, it has fell by 0 0.4 points. The Hispanic or Latino uh, unemployment rate was 6% in May 2020, rose to 18.9% in May and is at 4.3% in June, uh, June uh, 2022, in the last month. It was unchanged. The white unemployment rate, uh, rate was 3.9% in May of 2020, rose by 14.1% in May, and fell to 3.3% in June of 2022, a rise of 0 0.1 point over the month. The next graph shows the Black and African American unemployment rate to white uh, unemployment rate ratio from January 2018 when the white employment rate was 3.5% and black uh, or African-American rate was 7.5%. This graph allows us to see whether the relative position of the two cohorts has changed since the crisis. Uh, if it is rising, then the unemployment rate that the black and African-American cohort is either rising faster than the white unemployment rate or falling more slowly or a combination of uh, that relatively. In the pandemic, uh, as the pandemic hit, the ratio rose and peaked at 2.2% in December 2021. In June of 2022, the ratio was 1.76, a decline of 0 0.17 points over the month, which indicates that the relative position of the Black and African American cohorts have, has improved. Special analysis this month. What are wages? Uh, what are wages doing in the U.S. with inflation rising sharply at present, and the Federal Reserve pretending there is a major wage problem? The need uh, needs to be disciplined with a rising mass of unemployment. One would expect to see strong nominal wages growth pushing the price level along. The BLS reported that in June, average hourly uh, earnings for all employees on private non-farm payrolls uh, rose by 10% or 0.3% to $32.08 over the past 12 months. Average hourly earnings have increased by 5.1% in June. Hourly, average hourly earnings of private sector production and non-supervisory employees rose by 13 cents or 0.5% uh, to 27 Point forty-five. The following table shows the movement in a nominal average hourly earnings, or AHE, by sector and the inflation-adjusted AHE by select, uh, sector for June of 2022. Note uh, we are adjusting using the, the April CPI, the latest available. 
Okay, so let's see. Uh, total private, uh, month and annual, uh, 0 0.3 a month and 5.1 annual. Inflation adjusted, zero point, uh, uh, minus 0 0.2 and minus 3.1. Uh, goods producing, um, average hourly earnings, <clears throat> 0 0.2 and annual 4.7. Inflation adjusted, zero, pretty much, uh, yeah, majority of them are zero, it looks like, uh, 0 0.4, and the annual is 3.5. Mining and lodging, is it lodging or lodging? What does it do? Uh, 0 0.9 in a monthly and 3.7 in the annual. But with inflation, it is uh, 0 0.3 and minus uh, 4.6. And so on and so forth, as you can see the the actual uh, num number uh, number. Anyway. Let's see. Uh, the following graph shows the annual uh, the annual hourly earnings growth for all private sectors May twenty uh, May two thousand seven. In the last month, the growth rate declined and is well below the the inflation rate. Wages growth is not driving the supply side inflation acceleration. There is no acceleration trend. Uh, in fact, since March 2022, the monthly growth rate has been systematically declining. Uh, U.S. annual growth earnings growth all private employees. In 2020, it went up for about, about a month, then 2021, then through 2022, it kind of steadily declined. But just just above uh, the 2007 is no. It looks like anyway. Uh, note that the above uh, graph is the nominal terms. The latest uh, BLS uh, real earnings summary published uh, yesterday, no, two days ago now, uh, tells us that real average hourly earnings for all employees decreased 0.6% from April to May. Seasonally adjusted, this result stems from an increase of 0.3% in average hour earnings combined with an increase of 1.0% in the consumer price index for all urban consumers. Real average wage weekly earnings decreased by decreased by 0.7% uh, over the month due to the change of real average hourly earnings combined with no change in the average work week. Real average or hourly earnings decreased 3.0% seasonally adjusted from May 2021 to May 2022. The change is real and uh, average in real average hourly earnings combined with the decrease of 0.9% in the average work week result is a 3.9 uh, minus percent decrease in real average working earnings over this period. Workers are not catching up with the price level rises and can hardly be said to be uh, to be pressuring inflation. Unfortunately, you can't go back to my channel last year because I, I did take uh, quite a few uh, videos that would actually prove my point in regards to what I said about uh, wages uh, needing need to be increased by Congress and or a job guarantee program that would um, pretty much give competitiveness to the labor market, um, MMT version of job guarantee. Um, anyway, so what I did say back then, uh, again, unfortunately, I don't think you can find this. Uh, I did say back then that because Congress uh, didn't vote for a $15 minimum wage, which would at least uh, bring the competitiveness of the market value of employment um, up a little bit, um, forcing employers to permanently bring their uh, employees up to 15 bucks. I mean, Amazon did do it. Uh, Microsoft did it a long time ago, but we're talking about you know, a permanent uh, raise. That didn't happen. I said at that time that I'd see these uh, corporations doing that until they have the workers to replace the workers they already had. And by doing that, 
they cut out those who a lot of these places uh, uh, have the whole, um, oh, what do you call that? Um, not superiority, but uh, employees that have been there for years and years and years. Uh, seniority, there we go. A lot of these corporations have, you know, warehouse workers that have seniority. And if they bring in a uh, younger generation to work at 15 bucks, uh, that essentially they're able to move the, the, the employees with seniority out, either through layoffs or early retirement. Uh, and, and bring those, those new faces in. Uh, that may or may not be unionized. If they're not, if they don't want to be unionized, then they get the choice of not being in the union. Um, anyway, the point the point I make is, I said a long time ago that if they did this, they would do this just until there was enough workers to handle the new new workers to handle the the workload and lay off the rest. And or they will bring them on until you know their business catches up as far as the demand part of it. Then slowly but surely take away that raise and those benefits that they came in to enjoy and get used to. And that I think that's what we're seeing as far as the overall labor market. So uh, anyway, so let's see. That's why there's decline as far as the part of not because those corporations are not forced to keep those wages a livable wages and force them to bring it up depending on the cost of living. Anyway, so non-farm business sector uh, labor productivity decreased 7.3% in the first quarter of 2022 as output decreased 2.3% and hours worked increased by 5.4%. The, this is the largest decline in quarterly productivity since the third quarter of 40, 1947 when the measure decreased 11.7% from the same quarter a year ago. Non-farm business sector's labor productivity decreased to 0.6%, reflecting a 4.2% increase in output that was outpaced by a 4.8% uh, increase and now it's worked. This is the largest four, uh, fourth quarter decline since the fourth quarter of 1993. And the measure also declined to 0.6%. Even though productivity growth slumped in the first quarter of 2022, uh, our real hourly earnings growth continued to lag behind productivity growth over a large period. The following graph tells the story if uh, it shows real hourly earnings and labor productivity output per hour indexed at 100 in the May, uh, in the May quarter of 1970, around the time the two se uh, the series started to uh, diverge. Workers have enjoyed hardly any real wage growth since 1970, rising by 6.3%, uh, whereas productivity growth has risen by 162%. There have been massive redistribution of national income away from workers towards profits over this long period. This depicts the failure of capitalism to serve the best interests of the people. Let's see. Conclusion, in 2022, the first signs of a slowdown in the U.S. labor market became, became visible. The labor survey employment measure fell, as did the participation rate. There was a fall in the unemployment population ratio, a fairly reliable measure that the demand side is lagging behind the supply side. The U.S. market is still 524,000 jobs short from where it was at the end of May 2020. There are no fundamental rage, uh, rage, well, there could be rage, uh, wage pressures emerging at present um, despite, the, uh, despite the spikes in deflation or inflation, excuse me, arising from supply chain constraints. Let's see, the labor market uh, is still some ways from being at full employment. This is enough for the day. And now yeah, we're pausing at this present moment and come back.
Hey, welcome back. Uh, the last thing that I do uh, is from reverberations.org. Uh, Support them in any way you can. Uh, by, uh, donate whatever you can. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see at the end of this, I put together like a little meme of sorts, uh, pretty much saying what um, the name of the programs are on YouTube and here. But I do a couple of previews as well, but whatever for now. Uh, this is, let me just get down here, by a Harvey J.K. and by Alan Minsky. Uh, call for all progressive candidates and office holders to embrace a 21st century economic bill of rights. This was put up uh, June 25th, so uh, almost a month ago. Uh, economic justice, environmental and ecological justice, health and well-being section of the progressives. Uh, we must uh, we must guarantee all people re residing in the United States the right to the essentials of a good life, regardless of their income, race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or country origin. In his 1944 State of the Union address, President Franklin Roosevelt articulated popular American hero, or hopes, excuse me, and aspirations by calling for a second Bill of Rights, uh, an economic Bill of Rights for all Americans. Polls conducted by the White House in 1943 have revealed that often, uh, sorry, after the war, Americans uh, wanted a guaranteed uh, health care, guaranteed employment, and guaranteed aid to students. And it was after, by the way. Uh, don't know if I made that clear. Anyway, the increasing concentration of wealth, the widening inequalities, and the intensifying crisis of American democ democratic life demands that we advance this call now. Empowering by uh, empowered, excuse me, by those findings. Uh, FDR declared, we have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necess wait, necessitous men are not free men. We have accepted, so uh, we have accepted, so, so to speak, a second Bill of Rights under which the uh, new basic uh, security, uh, basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of sta uh, station, race, or creed. All of which is true today as it was 78 years ago. Therefore, we are proposing a 21st century economic bill of rights a bill of rights where all uh, we all call on all progressive candidates and and office holders to embrace a 21st century economic policy, a bill of rights will guarantee all people residing in the United States the right to the essentials of a good life, regardless of their income, race, religion, gender, sexual orientations, uh, sexual orientation, or country of origin. A 21st century econ economic bill of rights would establish that all Americans are entitled to one, the right to use, right to useful job that, maybe, right to a useful job that pays a living wage and to voice, uh, into a voice in the workplace through a union and collective bargaining. Two, the right to comprehensive quality health care. Three, the right to complete to a complete cost-free public education and access to broadband internet. Four, the right to decent, safe and decent, excuse me, decent of safe, affordable housing. Five, the right to, clean, to a clean environment and secure planet. Six, the right to a meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. Seven, the right to sound banking and financial services. Eight, the right to recre recreation and recreation and participation in public life. This roster of rights represents our draft for a 21st century economic bill of rights 
as we go forward, there are only uh, there are other proposals we might uh, consider, and from what we have already drawn elements in the 1960s, labor and civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph proposed a freedom budget inspired by FDR's four freedoms: freedom of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear. And in 1968, Martin. Luther King called for an economic bill of rights in 2018. Economist Mark Paul, William Doherty, and Derek Hamilton laid out a nine Democratic. Wait. Derek Hamilton laid out a nine item. Wait. Yeah, nine item. 21st century bill of rights. In 2020, Bernie Sanders issued a six-point economic bill of rights as part of his campaign for Democratic presidential nomination most recently. Wisconsin State Assemblywoman Christine Shelton and Francesca Hong have proposed a Wisconsin economic bill of rights. We have debated, we can debate the nuances of those proposals later. The increased concentration of wealth, the winding inequalities and the intensifying uh, crisis of American democ democratic life demands that we adv uh, advance this call now. And I guess this is the, uh, the embracing this 21st century economic bill of rights with, uh, will draw a sharp distinction between pro progressive Democrats and central uh, centrist Democrats, as well as Republicans, only progressive Democrats truly stand for the type of economic and society which the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, yearn to uh, uh, secure. So let's hear a little bit from the display, let's see. To all Americans? Of course you do. So let's think about what that means. On January 11, 1944, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, FDR, delivered his 11th State of the Union message to Congress. The United States was in the middle of its biggest and most consequential war, pitted against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. But Roosevelt didn't just talk about winning the war, he also spoke of what Americans needed to do to win the peace to come. In a speech to Congress that day, he called for a new Bill of Rights, an economic Bill of Rights. In the 1930s, Roosevelt and the American people had fought the Great Depression the worst economic and social catastrophe in U.S. history. Rallying to the President's New Deal, they not only had revived the economy, they had also subjected business and finance to public supervision and regulation, empowered the federal government to address the needs of working people, mobilized and organized labor unions and civil rights groups, established a social security system, expanded and upgraded the nation's public infrastructure, improved the environment, and cultivated and promoted the arts. In 1941, however, Americans confronted a new crisis, the Second World War. But here too, they went all out. In fact, they not only did all they could to fight fascism overseas, but also fought for democracy at home by dramatically expanding the labor and civil rights movements. And by early 1944, there was good cause to believe both that victory might soon be at hand and that further progressive action was possible. At the outset of the State of the Union speech, Roosevelt urged Americans to sustain the war effort, but he also now looked ahead, confident that Americans who had achieved so much wanted to not only revive the New Deal, but in every way expand upon it. Opinion polls conducted in 1943 indicated, for example, that 83% of Americans wanted a guarantee of health care for all. 73% supported launching new public works programs, and 79% wanted a federal jobs guarantee. Though he was too sick to appear in person before Congress to deliver the speech, Roosevelt went on radio and delivered a spirited address. And after reviewing the continuing war effort, he turned to the question of the post-war peace effort in the United States. This republic, he said, had its beginning and grew to its present strength under the protection of certain inalienable rights. They were our rights to life and liberty. As our nation has grown in size and stature, however, as our industrial economy expanded, these political rights proved inadequate to assure us equality in the pursuit of happiness. The words that followed are among the most radical in presidential history. 
We have come, FDR contended, to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. What he then proposed would be seen as far left today, though as he reminded his fellow Americans, it was not a repudiation of the promises enshrined in the Declaration and the Bill of Rights, but a continuation and realization of them. Indeed, only with economic rights could political rights be made real. As Roosevelt said, In our day, certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident a second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. The rights Roosevelt was proposing, a right to a home, to health care, to earn enough money to live comfortably, a guaranteed job, would be called socialism or even communism by today's conservatives. But whatever they might be labeled, they were rooted as FDR made clear in America's promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Empowered by the aspirations of those who had fought the Depression and were now fighting fascism, Roosevelt was projecting a path to a better, brighter, happier, and healthier future. All of these rights, he said, spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. But FDR knew all too well that there were those who would fiercely oppose them, as they always had. And he warned his fellow citizens against what he called the grave dangers of rightist reaction. What Roosevelt laid out in his State of the Union was something simple, but radical. It was that history wasn't something to be left in the past, but to be constantly renewed and remade. New times demand new freedoms. Just a few years earlier, his Solicitor General, Robert H. Jackson, a future Supreme Court Justice, told the members of the National Lawyers Guild, we too are founders. We too are makers of a nation. We too are called upon to write, to defend, and to make live new bills of right. At a demonstration in New York City, 1.4 million people showed up to hear Senator Robert Wagner enthusiastically defend the call for a second Bill of Rights. Labor and civil rights groups actively campaigned for it. And in the presidential election later that year, Roosevelt won a fourth term as president with a resounding 432 electoral votes. Roosevelt would not live to achieve his dream. At his fourth and final inauguration in 1945, he appeared sick and frail. While he was getting his portrait painted just a few months later in Warm Springs, Georgia, he put his hand over his forehead, slumped over, and died. The second Bill of Rights was never realized. The forces of rightist reaction that FDR had warned of were too powerful. Corporate executives and conservatives soon took to fomenting Cold War fears and purging public life of leftists, not only to block the hope for revival and expansion of the New Deal, but also to crush the very idea and memory of Roosevelt's proposed economic Bill of Rights. That doesn't mean, of course, that his vision has to remain shrouded and forgotten. What FDR promised, though still radical, remains deeply possible if we have the will to recover it and to advance it. We, too, can be founders. We, too, can be makers of a nation. We, too, are called upon to write, to defend, to make live new bills of rights. I'm Harvey Kay, Professor Emeritus of Democracy and Justice at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, for the Gravel Institute. Uh, thank you for watching uh, with that said and uh, talk to you guys tomorrow. Thanks.
Peace out for now.